So thank you. So first of all, uh, as everybody, I'd like to warmly thank uh, Joan and Gabrielle for organizing this uh, kind of family reunion. It's really touching to be here with uh, lots of friends and mentors uh, uh, that have influenced uh, years of work. Uh, so uh, really, thanks. And of course, uh, happy birthday, Stefan. Here is the first cake. Uh, this is a cake uh, from uh, Perez Summer School and uh, Patrick Flandre who is here will probably recognize uh, the motto uh, from the, this uh, summer school on machine learning and signal processing. So, uh, so for those who don't read French, uh, there's, a, there's a pun on Oedipus complex or uh, deep uh, complex of, uh, the, the, of depth <laughs> and uh, rapture of the deep. Uh, so. Uh, before, okay, before talking about sparsity, deep networks, and uh, so on, a few words about uh, Stefan. Uh, so I was really lucky to be introduced to you uh, uh, nearly 20, well, okay, I, we don't count now. <laughs> and that was a time where uh, the people didn't talk about sparsity so much, but non linear approximation, and maybe uh, the, the, one of the hot uh, words was uh, uh, decision theory, uh, uh, probably precursor of uh, machine learning. And Stefan also introduced this uh, wonderful notion of dictionaries, which uh, somehow resonates with uh, the idea, uh, the current idea today that overcompleteness and overparameterization are, can be helpful rather than, uh, uh, than, uh, than an issue. Uh, a few things I believe uh, I try to you know, gather what's the essence of what I learned from, uh, from Stefan at that uh, period. First, there's a vision. I mean, any, any of uh, Stefan's students might have heard the word geometry. Uh, right, yeah. Geometry uh, uh, of images. Well, I was studying uh, applications to sounds, so geometry in sounds is a bit uh, harder, but uh, uh, trust me, uh, those who did sound with Stefan also heard the word geometry. <laughs> Uh, another thing, and it's also uh, uh, maybe related to Dave's talk, I mean, this, there's this notion of experimental math, where uh, yeah, both, it's both because you know, math should be confronted to reality, but it's also there's, there's this uh, virtuous circle of uh, uh, doing, uh, st studying, experimenting, observing phenomena, drawing conjectures, uh, uh, proposing new algorithms, uh, proposing modules, and so, uh, so that's something uh, uh, absolutely essential, and it's uh, it's really a lesson uh, I learned at uh, that moment. And more than that, there's of course uh, uh, this uh, mindset of uh, being uh, daring, uh, you know, uh, and also being uh, challenging a bit what you uh, what seems obvious to uh, to uh, everybody. I'm sure I don't do it uh, as much as well as uh, as Stefan, uh, but it's something that is uh, very helpful to get you uh, to to help you become. A bit confident in the research path that you uh, uh, that you explore. Uh, last, uh, you see the quotes. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure it's, it's exact, but that's something which is probably hard to believe today. Uh, at the at the time of uh, this, uh, where we, in this first batch of uh, PhD students uh, at Ecole Polytechnique, uh, Stefan was really insisting that uh, we should do science first, and that <laughs> publications they come, you know, when the science is ready. So. Uh, no journal publication before the PhD is, uh, uh, is completed. Well, there was a few conferences. Uh, you know. And, uh, okay, uh, I, I also would like to uh, uh, take uh, advantage of uh, this uh, audience to uh, uh, warmly thank uh, uh, Emmanuel. I think he's, he was here yesterday. I think he was not able to be uh, here today, but Emmanuel uh, is the person who allowed me to meet uh, Stefan and who introduced me to Stefan. So uh, he gave a course on mathematics and music at Ecole Normale Supérieure, and that's a, a wonderful person, uh, uh, which was also uh, uh, very uh, influential during the, the whole uh, this this whole period. Okay, uh, so now there's a, uh, since the thesis, uh, a few things happened, and uh, there's uh, what I will be presenting is uh, actually um, a sort of story. Uh, uh, Stefan likes to tell stories, so I'm trying to uh, learn from him how to tell stories. It's a story of uh, a few explorations that took place with a number of people. First, uh, uh, in, uh, during almost 20 years in Rennes with a group on audio signal processing, and more recently in the uh, OCAM team that, uh, is, uh, uh, that is, has just started at Economia Supérieure de Lyon. A story around 
well, various notions of sparsity first in inverse problems and uh, uh, as you know, we have a nice hammer, sparsity, there's this depth, uh, we like to understand who, uh, how much we can uh, 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 exploit this hammer and uh, part of the story is uh, on uh, highlighting some of the nails that don't fit. Uh, so sparsity, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a very multifaceted uh, uh, property. Uh, first, uh, uh, for audio, for images, this is really a gift. I mean, there are representations uh, where uh, the natural representation is not sparse, but we know of ways of transforming uh, raw data into a domain where it's sparse. And it's a, it's, it's a gift. Why is it a gift? First, because uh, you know, sparsity is, is a natural objective. It's uh, because it allows to save bits or it allows to save uh, flops. And Stefan has been working on both uh, aspects. Uh, so saving bits uh, to, uh, to, I mean, using the wavelets uh, transform or the matching pursuit decomposition have both been useful to develop uh, uh, coders. Uh, well, some have made it uh, through the uh, industrial developments, uh, some have uh, had the more uh, hectic uh, stories. Uh, uh, but also in terms of flops, if you think of uh, this, uh, uh, I mean, there's sparsity also hidden in the, in the uh, wavelet transform algorithm, uh, which you, I mean, here is the initial description as uh, of the, uh, in, the, in the famous paper uh, in terms of filters, but if you think of a wave transform as a linear function applied to a vector, uh, this, the matrix corresponding to this uh, transform is associated to the fast transform because it's a product of a few sparse matrices. And this is a bit of the guideline of uh, part of the, the talk I will be uh, given here. It's designed. And uh, when you, uh, when you uh, are at, at an era where uh, everything is learned, there's the, of, of course, uh, uh, it's natural to try to learn, and, uh, but uh, keeping sparsity in the process. Uh, so sparsity is, of course, an objective, as I said, but it's also, uh, it, turned, it has turned out to be a very useful prior uh, for solving uh, many, uh, many problems. And here again, you have a hint of the uh, geometry <laughs> Of, uh, that's uh, uh, from Stefan. So here is the, the geometric picture of uh, inverse problems and why sparsity allows to have uh, small dimensional unions of subspaces uh, that uh, combine nicely to make uh, underdetermined problems indeed solvable. Uh, and not only solvable, but solvable with, uh, prefer, well, with, with algorithms that have provable performance and uh, bounded complexity. So, this whole, uh, uh, th this whole story has led uh, to a strong, I mean, a know-how, a well-established know-how. Uh, Emmanuel is uh, well placed here uh, is, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to know about this, this uh, know-how. So uh, if we were to summarize some of these know-how is, you know, L1, it's a good, it's a good uh, regularizer. It promotes sparsity. Uh, the uh, second know-how is that uh, probably L2 or uh, ridge regression is, uh, tends not to promote sparsity, more uh, smoothness or uh, flatness or re uh, a spread of, uh, of, uh, of coefficients. Maybe a third, uh, an another pair of uh, know-how that we've learned, and uh, I would relate them somehow to, uh, to, to the work of Stefan on matching pursuit, is that uh, you know, when you solve traditional inverse problems under a sparsity constraint, what is really hard is to find where are the non-zero coefficients. But once you have the coefficients, well, solve a least squares problem, this is easy. So, and, and even uh, if you have too many coefficients, uh, thresholding or greed to pick up the largest coefficients is also uh, a good way to select the support. So this is, these are lessons uh, we have learned and that's, that are true lessons valid in <coughs> the context of linear inverse problems and, uh, and sparsity. So, uh, and, uh, so I mentioned that the sparsity is a sort of gift from nature. Uh, there, was, uh, this, uh, there were these pictures. Here is an, uh, the histogram view of uh, coefficients on a, an audio sound. And sparsity uh, is visible here because there's a, there's a huge peak around zero. There are many small coefficients. But there's also a few uh, significantly larger coefficients and uh, well, negative or positive here. Now, 
what if uh, what about uh, sparsity in deep networks after all uh, we there's a number of uh, uh, off-the-shelf networks covalent networks or with a certain uh, with a certain number of uh, uh, layers some of them are also dense layers how how do the, the coefficients of this network look like and if you do this type of uh, you do some statistics on uh, on these networks well uh, what can you say? Uh, at least, uh, if you look at the 11 million uh, uh, parameters of a, uh, a ResNet 18 uh, network, uh, it, you, it seems like you have uh, uh, some accumulation around zero. Here, the coefficients are normalized. The one and minus one are the largest coefficients, but it's not highly picked. And even more, if you are if you restrict uh, to uh, you know, let's say one convolutional layer, so these are the net, the, 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 the parameters of uh, kernels. Uh, well, then it looks probably more like a Gaussian, like than uh, uh, than uh, uh, something very peaked at zero. So sparsity is not given. Sparsity is not given yet. Sparsity remains an objective. If uh, I mean, it uh, there are reasons why we may want to get more sparsity in uh, these networks. Uh, some reasons are computational, although there are challenges in uh, using GPUs that efficiently uh, take advantage of uh, sparsity. But it could be for memory reasons, or it could be for many other reasons. Uh, I'll, I'll mention uh, uh, privacy issues. Uh, uh, having sparse net uh, networks uh, can be shown to uh, uh, provide more robustness, uh, more, uh, more more privacy, and 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 there uh, we'll discuss this a bit uh, later. So, if we want to get sparse, uh, sparse uh, deep networks, uh, well, uh, we would like, of course, to leverage the existing uh, knowledge, uh, but the much of this talk will be about negative results. Uh, to showing that uh, at least if, if you, you know, uh, abruptly or naively try to reuse uh, existing technology or existing know-how, it just breaks down in, the, in, the, in a deep context. So let's start with the uh, idea that uh, L1 minimization uh, promotes sparsity. Uh, no doubt it's true for linear inverse problems. But now, uh, and now let's look at a simple example, which is blind deconvolution. So you're given a signal X, which is the convolution of a filter and a source. And here, let us assume that both the filter and the source are sparse, but you don't know them. Uh, if, if you know one of them, if you're just doing deconvolution, but not blind deconvolution, uh, it's reasonable to believe that uh, uh, under some appropriate assumptions, solving an L1 minimization problem will allow you to recover. Uh, your sparse source, and vice versa if you reverse the roles of, of both. So it looks completely natural to uh, solve a joint minimization problem and uh, hope that you'll get uh, something, uh, a sparse solution. Well, it turns out it's not the case. It was observed by uh, uh, Levin in in a paper uh, showing that uh, you know that solving a map problem with uh, uh, Laplacian priors did not uh, provide uh, uh, a sparse solution, and uh, together with Emmanuel Vincent and uh, Alexis Benichou in 2013, we showed that actually uh, that it's, it can be proved that uh, the global optimum of this type of problem is trivial. It's uh, either you put the filter to be a Dirac and uh, your, your source to be uh, the, your observation or the opposite. These are, uh, uh, these are global optima of your problem. And it's, uh, well, in a sense, this will be a sparse solution because Dirac is sparse, but the number of non-zeros in the convolution is still uh, much bigger than the sum of the number of non-zeros in uh, both terms. Okay, and what is behind the scene? Uh, it's, uh, the f it's, it's a scaling invariance that appears in this uh, type of problem. And we'll see it again. Uh, now, another thing, and uh, Emmanuel uh, sort of spoiled a, a bit of, uh, of it in his uh, question to, uh, to Edouard a minute ago. It's uh, uh, when you do ReLU uh, network uh, training, uh, 
with weight decay regularization. This is another instance of a problem where, okay, let's just recall uh, quickly, you have a network, uh, a shallow network with one hidden layer, ReLU, so it's implemented by a function with uh, the expression you can see. And if you train this network, there's something that fits to the data, and uh, but uh, there's this uh, least squares regularization, and well, our intuition, our natural intuition from uh, uh, inverse problems regularization would be this will promote uh, you know equal for weights probably for every uh, uh, for for uh, for all these uh, parameters, and it turns out it's really not the case. Again, uh, scale invariance, scaling ambiguities in the problem play a role, and uh, there's a so-called neural balance theorem that says that the optimum, so the norms of the incoming weights to a neuron and the norm of the outgoing weights to a neuron will be equal at the global optimum. Uh, but also uh, that the solution, uh, this, can, this is indeed uh, also the solution of a convex problem, but a convex problem where the number, uh, the dimension of the problem uh, can be exponential in the number of neurons. So uh, this also can raise uh, practical questions to, for regard, besides the uh, uh, stability that uh, uh, Edward uh, mentioned. Okay, so uh, Let's uh, look at uh, uh, slightly in more details to this uh, scaling ambiguity. Uh, for the, uh, the, the, the blind deconvolution problem, it's quite clear. If you scale up uh, the filter and scale down the, uh, the source, uh, you, don't, uh, you preserve uh, the, the fact that their convolution is uh, unchanged. So uh, when you believe that you're solving a regularization problem with the sum of the L1 norms, actually, it's not difficult to show that you're so solving a, a problem where it's the square root of the product of the norm that you're minimizing. And here, to get, to get uh, that uh, the, uh, uh, the global optimum is trivial uh, is, is a simple inequality. If you have this type of inequality uh, of, uh, of uh, convolution, well, it's, it's easy to show that uh, uh, putting everything on, the, uh, on either the filter or the source, keeping a Dirac for the rest, uh, you get a minimizer, global minimizer. Now for ReLU nets and uh, weight decay, uh, well, it's essentially the same uh, process here. There's no full, th th the scaling ambiguity is not full, it's posi uh, but this, uh, uh, each neuron, each ReLU net neuron is invariant to positive rescaling. And again, you can play the same game. And while you think you're minimizing the sum of the L2 norms, you're indeed so, uh, minimizing a sort of group lasso penalty on uh, products of rank one matrices uh, so associated to uh, products of incoming and outcoming weights from each neuron. Okay, uh, so L1 does not doing uh, what we uh, believe. L2 is not uh, willing to do uh, uh, as, as we would like. And uh, uh, now, greed. <laughs> uh, okay, it's, uh, uh, so this is a, uh, uh, let's play a game. Uh, and I, uh, you see who I've invited to play, uh, to play this game. So Alice. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so Alice will be uh, uh, training and releasing uh, openly uh, a, uh, a rally network. Uh, let's say it's, uh, uh, it's a ResNet 18 that you've trained on some uh, on ImageNet, and uh, yeah, okay, you're really you're releasing it. But uh, Bob, uh, <laughs> so Bob is willing to uh, think that the network is not sparse enough. Uh, you need to reduce. Uh, you have limited memory. You want to fit it on the device. So you would like to reduce to to get it to be sparse. But you don't want to re to retrain everything. You don't want to fine tune. Just want to reduce uh, the, the, uh, the sparsity of the, uh, of the uh, I mean, improve the sparsity of the network. So what would you do? Uh, what would be the natural, the, probably the most natural way? I, I know, Stefan would, be something, would do something more clever, but it's Bob. Yeah, so Bob, <laughs> Bob uh, is just willing to uh, prune, to prune out the network. So you'll take, uh, you know, maybe the most expensive convolutional layer and say, uh, okay, I need to prune out 50% of the coefficients. No, no, not randomly. Uh, <laughs> greed, greedily, <laughs> greedily. Sorry, yeah, Bob, Bob uh, still, you know, he, he, read your, uh, he read your papers, uh, so he knows that greed is, uh, is good, so it, it will keep the largest coefficients. 
And uh, OK, it gets uh, the, some accuracy, uh, some top 1 and top 5 accuracy uh, with this network. But now, OK, that's, uh, that's what Bob when, uh, uh, does on the network that Alice provided. But now, yeah, yeah, some, somebody pretending to be Alice. Uh, is, uh, is doing something nasty on the network. It takes the network from Alice and adversi uh, adversarially rescales the, the network. And by, by rescaling, there's a way of you know, increasing the size of the small coefficients, decreasing the size of the big ones. I mean, you, uh, there, there are limits to what you can do, but, but, but you can mess up. And here is that, the, the, and, and when Bob uh, prunes it out, well, there's a huge drop in performance. So uh, it turns out that uh, there, so this pruning strategy, there are, uh, there are techniques, uh, iterative magnitude pruning, etc., that, that are based on, uh, on this. There are refined methods in particular. I mean, I remember the, there's a brain surgeon method that, uh, that uh, try to uh, have uh, cleaner ways of finding which coefficients are significant. But intrinsically in this setting, there are scaling ambiguities. And there's a risk. Uh, so there are many things we don't know why the methods, uh, why is it that uh, the coefficients that are provided by existing training methods uh, are reasonably well pruned uh, by these techniques? And why is it that adversarial, uh, they, they don't provide uh, adversarial, uh, intrinsically adversarial uh, parameters? But OK, uh, so. Finding the support, the, the, the most important uh, coefficient is not necessarily uh, easy. And now, okay, assume that we know which are the important coefficients. Is it in, uh, does it become an easier problem? We all know that, uh, okay, so we have to, pro let's look at two problems here. The classical linear inverse problem uh, under sparsity constraints and a problem of uh, just a factorization of a matrix into a product of two matrices where we would like to impose sparsity. Now, usually it's hard to find the support. Assume that you know which is the support. So on, on uh, your left, uh, well, if the, uh, don't, when you don't have the support, it's hard. It's, it's proved to be NP-hard. Again, uh, uh, a contribution of uh, Stéphane uh, a while ago. But when the support is fixed, it's an easy linear inverse problem. It's an easy least squares problem. On the, on the right, uh, it's uh, on your right, uh, it's quite different. And uh, this is something we were able to show with, uh, uh, I mean, okay, it's quite different. So here is the question. I'm already giving, spoiling the, the, the answer. Uh, what if you know the support? Uh, is it easy or hard? Well, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's actually a much nastier problem. So these are results we uh, obtained with Kok uh, Tungle and Elisa Ricchetti uh, 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 Cocteau uh, is about to, uh, to defend. Uh, so if you look at this problem, first, the minimizer may not even exist. There are uh, pairs of supports where the problem is, uh, is so uh, nasty that it's, the minimizer does not necessarily exist. And you probably all know, uh, without knowing one example, if it's uh, supports associated to an, to an LU factorization, there are instances where the problem does not have, uh, uh, admit a minimizer. And it's also NP hard to uh, uh, approximate. Well, of course, something uh, uh, again I learned from Stefan. Uh, it's, uh, it's not because you've proved that something is NP hard that you have to give up. Uh, and so the, 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 the usual uh, uh, sparse uh, optimization problem is NP hard. But then you try to, uh, to identify uh, easier instances or heuristic algorithms, understand when these algorithms work. Here, it turns out there, uh, it's possible to uh, highlight, OK, I don't have the time to detail these supports, but there are supports that are useful in practice for which the problem is well posed and enjoys lots of nice properties. OK, and so I will not give an example of the support, but an of this type of support, but now uh, an example of how it can be used in a deeper context. And here, the deeper context is uh, butterfly factorization. So who has heard about butterfly factorizations before? OK. Uh, so uh, it's something that appears in particular uh, when you consider the FFT. Uh, the, so the, Fourier, the matrix associated to Fourier transform has the so-called butterfly structure, which means that the matrix is the product of a few sparse factors. 
And they, these factors are not only sparse, but they have this very particular structure that I display here. Uh, it's also a family of, uh, uh, of uh, structured uh, matrices uh, with this product of uh, butterfly uh, factors that uh, is emerging in the use of uh, structured sparsity in deep learning. Because if you have arbitrary sparsity patterns, implementation of GPUs is not very convenient. But these are patterns uh, that uh, are can be uh, much more efficiently implemented. And you know, there's this circle of, uh, OK, it's a bit easier to implement. And so we, uh, we can play with them. And, and if we can show that there's improvement, it has more motivation to uh, do even more efficient implementations. So uh, what happens with these uh, uh, types of factors? They have a very particular property. The property is that if you, uh, I mean, you have a, a product of several factors, and you do some bracketing take some factors on the left, some factors on the right, and look at the product of the support, I mean, or the support of the product, that's the same. And it turns out that if you, you know, take the support from the left, the support from the left, the right, now you have a, just a pair of supports. So we are back to our initial, uh, the problem I mentioned before. And this pair of support has all the good properties that I mentioned. So this is a problem that you can solve with an efficient algorithm. And now, well, well, you can imagine, you can do it uh, uh, progressively to, uh, to, uh, well, uh, to uh, iterate and uh, recover uh, uh, some factorization. So uh, uh, let's, uh, let's have a look at uh, uh, what's uh, uh, some, uh, the, 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 the brick, the ingredient here is this two-factor problem. And uh, to solve this two-factor problem, there are several approaches, uh, several natural approaches. Uh, one is to put it in, a, you know, in, a, in PyTorch. You have, uh, you know, two layers. You have support constraints. You have no, no nonlinearity. Use your favorite uh, uh, algorithm, uh, Adam gradient descent, etc. Or you could take into account the particular structure and then use the algorithm that we've identified. And here are the traders between computation time and uh, uh, accuracy of the, uh, uh, the approximation. Because here, uh, well, yeah, you know the, the particular structure. You can exploit the particular structure and do something that goes beyond uh, the general purpose gradient descent to address this problem. And you know, the behavior is similar for, the, for deeper uh, factorization. How am I doing on time? You have two minutes. OK. OK, uh, so you know, I focused on the on the problems, let's see if uh, and uh, some elements of solution here using structure in, sparsi uh, in sparsity. Uh, you know, how can we harness this scale invariance? Uh, is there a way to harness or even exploit uh, this scale invariance uh, uh, to go uh, later? Because in uh, in any network, I mean, you may have a huge network with all of neurons. Let's zoom on one neuron here, and this neuron has scale invariance meaning that if you scale the in incoming weights and uh, accordingly scale down the uh, outgoing weights, you don't change the input-output function. So f theta, theta are the parameters. f theta is the implemented function. You don't change the function. So uh, not, ch not changing the functions is, uh, I mean, it, it means there is uh, ambiguity in the parameters, but it also means that you have freedom. For a given implementation of the network, you have freedom in choosing, in uh, moving along these scaling equivalent uh, parameters, and maybe it's possible to exploit this uh, freedom. So here are uh, two uh, quick examples. By wandering ar along uh, uh, these equivalence classes, uh, first thing you can do is when you train networks, you can optimize heuristic criteria uh, to somehow condition your uh, optimization. So between uh, SGD steps, uh, there's a possibility, and when combined with batch normalization, there's a way to improve the speed of convergence of uh, algorithms. Uh, the other thing you can do is, once you have a trained network, uh, if you want to reduce uh, the, uh, the number of bits to code your network, uh, if you, want, uh, you may want to uh, quantize your network weights. Again, you can play with scaling. And here, uh, you can see two curves as a f function of the number of bits. The, uh, the blue curve is if you simply quantize the coefficients that are, give, that are given to you. The uh, red curve is uh, when you choose an optimal scaling. And we have 
um, uh, we have a, uh, an optimized uh, algorithm. So, I mean, there's an elementary brick for which we have something optimized, and when the brick is combined, it's, uh, uh, it's not optimal, but it's optimized, right? And uh, so you gain essentially 30%, uh, with 30% less bits, you have the same uh, uh, accuracy. Uh, okay, uh, there are some other consequences of uh, scale invariance uh, that uh, you may want uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, that may allow uh, further exploitation. So remember this uh, uh, neural balance property that I mentioned, which can be rewritten as you know uh, some quantity being zero at the optimizer. Uh, this is when you optimize with weight decay. On your right uh, is uh, something different. It's known that. Uh, uh, if you do the gradient flow uh, idealization of gradient descent, there, there are conservation laws along the optimization of uh, your um, uh, uh, the, of your parameters. So you have a loss function, you do gradient descent. There's a conservation law, and uh, it it's quite similar to the to. to uh, but here it's something without weight decay, but it's uh, quite similar to uh, uh, the balancedness property at the optimum of weight decay. Uh, this raises some questions. Uh, maybe the, 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 the mere properties of scale invariance, uh, it's not, maybe it's not a coincidence, well, probably it's not a coincidence, but this also raises some questions because, I mean, these are, this is a number of conservation laws. You can wonder whether there are more conservation laws, uh, how many there are, and how they can be exploited. Because conservation laws, they somehow provide a, a sort of implicit bias. I mean, that you, you because you're, there are properties of your initialization that you are carried over all during uh, the, the training. And this is uh, something. Okay, I don't know if I. Okay, uh, this is something that uh, this is my last uh, the, my last slide. So conservation laws. Uh, it's possible to de formally define conservation laws. There's also a step that consists in. Uh, understanding what, what it means to have independent conservation laws, because it's easy from one conservation law to build infinitely many uh, uh, related ones. Uh, once you know uh, this notion of independence of conservation laws, you can wonder how many independent conservation laws uh, are uh, hold for uh, this type of optimization on a given architecture. And uh, what we did with uh, Gabriel and, uh, and Sibyl Marcotte uh, is uh, to provide uh, an analysis based on Lie algebra that allows to uh, design two algorithms. One algorithm is an algorithm that uh, provides a lower bound on the number of, uh, uh, of uh, conservation laws. And it, it's not only that it provides a lower bound, it provides conservation laws. It computes polynomial conservation laws. And there's another algorithm that provides an upper bound based on Lie algebras, and on uh, a selection of uh, uh, deep uh, linear or, or ReLU networks. Uh, it turns out that that's the two match. So the first algorithm provides conservation laws. The second one says, OK, you have all the conservation laws. So the next thing we'd like to do, of course, is to, uh, uh, well, understand, uh, uh, well, go beyond the algorithm, they, they provide conjectures. Can we prove that these, uh, that these are the right conservation laws and how can we exploit them? Uh, okay, uh, I think I will skip this. Uh, there's uh, something uh, when you want to avoid, uh, okay, did I say I, I will skip it? <laughs> <laughs> Two words. How do you leverage, uh, you would like to avoid having to deal with the scaling ambiguities? Uh, and I will not describe this, this embedding which avoids uh, having to deal with scaling ambiguities. All of these nice properties, you may ask, you're free to ask questions uh, <laughs> later. <laughs> and it's time to conclude. <laughs> so, <right>. Thank you. <laughs> right, any questions for Remy before we go to the tea break? In the chain deep networks, do we observe sparsity when we take usual deep network? If you don't enforce sparsity on the weights, on the usual deep network, do we observe sparsity in the weights or in the activation layers be beyond the first one? So that's, that's a wonderful question, and it's, some, it's a question that's only uh, 
uh, thought about somehow two weeks ago, and hence the figures, I mean, which is absolutely natural, and hence the, uh, the histogram that I uh, asked uh, Antoine Gonon, a uh, very, very good student uh, in, uh, in his second year of uh, PhD, to provide. Uh, so, you know, looking at the histogram is not enough to really, uh, you know, uh, what, what is your criterion to distinguish uh, sparse or not, or not sparse? But the, but the impression is that it's not so sparse to begin with. Yes, so it's not naturally sparse. Uh, so it relates. So, so actually, it works you know, sparsity. Being sparse. Yes, it works without being sparse. Uh, it's uh, so. There's this question of uh, you know, sparsity. Is it there? Is it something you want, or is it something you believe is there? Uh, uh, so I don't necessarily believe that sparsity is naturally present in deep networks. Uh, yes, you are looking at the weights and considering whether they are so sparse. What, uh, what um, Stefan asked is about activations and Both. maybe their sparsity is more natural. Is activation type sparse? Uh, this is another uh, you know, thing that, that said... Uh, yeah. You think? They tend to be. Well, there's a lot of zeros. Yes. <laughs> well, if there's no zero, yeah, there's at least half percent or something, uh, 50%, otherwise, uh, otherwise everything is active and it's a linear network, right? Uh, yeah. Does that count? No. <laughs> but, you know, uh, precisely this is the type of question that we started wondering about. And, and uh, I, mean, I was fairly sure that somebody should have learned and documented it. I didn't find it. Uh, but if you have any reference, I would really love to. Uh, to, to see more about that. But it's really about, you know, uh, okay, is it there or do we want it to be, to be here? Uh, and if we want it to be here, why would we like to, it to be here? Uh, I guess that if we really want to have high performance, it's not sure that we want to have sparsity. But today there are many reasons why we may want to have uh, sparsity, because maybe we want to have trade-offs between, you know, budget and uh, and, and performance, uh, but also, and uh, some students in my group have uh, played with it. There's also the notion of privacy. Uh, there's a there's a strong uh, on a certain number of uh, problems. There's a strong correlation between the level of uh, pruning and the level of robustness uh, to membership attacks and this type of uh, problems. Uh, plus generalization and uh, a number of uh, 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 and and quantization, of course. All right. Um, shall we take uh, remaining questions to the to the coffee break? And uh, thanks for your